from the Mercy One Studio. Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulus every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy One studio, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM, around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com, and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. I am Joe Stopulus, and today I am joined by Kevin Wells, author of the book, The Priest We Need to Save the Church. Let's start in a word of prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to thank everyone who made it out to the Men's Conference, Iowa Catholic Men's Conference this weekend. My thanks again uh, to Matt Campbell. Wonderful event. Huge event. Uh, just feels great uh, to have that, to have a jump off point. I am not kidding, guys. We want to start a men's movement here in Des Moines, Iowa. We really do. We want to get every guy on a weekly basis meeting with other men, strengthening each other. It's not easy. We cannot do this alone. Living an authentic Catholic life of virtue is not done easily. It's not done alone. It's done in, in, in solidarity with other men. And so that's what we need. That's really what we need. And that's what we're calling for you to do. Uh, reach out to us. We'll try to get you plugged in. Uh, if there's any way we can help you get plugged in. But as I said, if you aren't in the men's group today, just start one. You, you can start one. You can find a couple of friends and you can start one. I also mentioned this Wednesday, a couple of days coming up, Ash Wednesday. Take Lent seriously. It's an opportunity to really strengthen your faith. The devil is out to get us with lots of distractions, lots of noise in today's society. Use Lent as a time to enter into that desert quiet. Embrace fasting. Embrace prayer. Embrace almsgiving. Really excited about the interview on the other side of the break. Kevin Wells, this book is awesome. Uh, I read it in literally like three or four days. I could not put it down. Uh, The priests we need to save the church. We're going to head to a short break. And when we return, we'll be back with Kevin Wells. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Lee and Eddie in the Morning is provided by Five Sons Naturescapes. Five Sons Naturescapes is a Catholic veteran-owned family company providing premium outdoor landscapes. Extend your living space outdoors with patios, pergolas, fencing, and retaining walls. Outdoor lighting is another way to enjoy your landscaping day and night. Five Sons Naturescapes will spend the time to understand your needs and create your perfect outdoor space. Learn more about Five Sons Naturescapes at fivesonsnaturescapes.com. Thank you to Five Sons Naturescapes for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for underwriting Christ is the Answer with Father Ricardo, heard Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Confluence Brewing Company is a local brewery in Des Moines featuring seasonal and limited release beers. They have cans and growlers to go, apparel, and other gifts for family and friends. Live music is featured in the tap room. Confluence Brewing Company is located off the bike trail south of Grays Lake. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio on the web at confluencebrewing.com. That's confluencebrewing.com. My help comes from you. You're right here pulling me through. You carry Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis, and today I am joined by Kevin Wells. He is a former sports reporter with the Tampa Tribune, where he covered Major League Baseball, among other sports. Uh, he is a freelance writer and evangelist addressing various Catholic topics. His most recent book, The Priests We Need to Save the Church, is out, and it is awesome. Kevin, welcome to the show. Joe, thanks for having me on. Hey, man. So I uh, was so at the beginning of every year, I take about a week or so and really dive into okay, how did last year go? What do I want? To, how am I planning for this year? Faith, family, work, all these other things. Uh, I make a list of books that I'd like to read. Um, whether I get to all those, I'm usually adding in a whole bunch of other ones. And I talk with a friend of mine, 
And one of the books he put in my, my hand this year was this exact book. And so I'm like, well, I need to reach out to this guy. We'll have him onto the show. I get the book. I cannot put it down. And I've told everyone I know about this great book. So thank you for writing it. We'll start with that. Oh, Joe, that's, uh, that's wonderful for you to say. It's, uh, you know, Joe, I'm just like you. I'm no different from you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always looking to, um, to sort of conform my life to Christ's will. And, and sometimes we pick up a book or, or scripture or whatever it might be. And, and every now and then we, we get lucky and we're like, you know what, this, uh, this moved me in some way. So I'm glad that my book was able to resonate with you. Yeah. And I think with our listeners, I mean, with, with men, it just hits a chord with me specifically. And I think men in general need to, we enjoy a challenge. We enjoy being called out. We enjoy the heroic stories. And I think your book shows what that can look like when manifested uh, into a good holy priest and what the church could look like. Uh, I will say this. I, when I saw that it was not Father Kevin Wells, you've probably gotten this before. Um, when, I got, when it wasn't Father Kevin Wells, I'm like, who is this guy telling us what kind of priest we need? You address that about a hundred times in the book. Uh, and <laughs> you said, listen, this is not just me. This is me and a whole bunch of other priests saying what we need to do. But I think what's so interesting, right from the first page, Kevin, you it, it just took me off guard, quite frankly. Your first pages was not about priests. It was about you guys and your struggle with infertility. Can you talk about that and then how that leads into the book? Well, sure. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm an old sports writer, so, so the last thing I want to do is just go right into sort of the characteristics of the priest. So, so what I was hoping to do was sort of lead the reader into what a holy and faith-filled priest does, who does not tolerate the intolerable. My wife and I got married, and within a year we found out that we could not have children. We were infertile, and it was devastating for us because um, we had desired a large family. Anyway, so the priest at our parish down in St. Pete Beach, Florida, had told my wife, look, if your conscience are, are clear, you can, you can go forward with in vitro fertilization. Well, that's, in, that's you know, impermissible in the Catholic Church. We're, 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 we're the lone faith that says, no, it's, it's, not, it's not allowed. And so this priest actually drove a canyon into our marriage because I wanted to adopt. So the very thing this priest was meant to do was sort of introduce us into carrying our crosses. But instead, he just said, ah, you know what, just, just do it your way. So it took a holy priest, um, an exceptional priest, Monsignor Thomas Wells, to say, you know what, uh-uh, you, you can't do this as much as you want. You need to give this enormous blue whale-sized cross to Christ and say, Lord, I will trust you in this darkness. I'll trust you in this cave, because even though I know that um, in a certain sense you're trying to draw us to you through this through this infertility. It hurts, and it's painful. My wife cries herself to sleep every night, but we're going to trust you. And it took him to sort of introduce an omnibus of redemptive suffering and what it was to carry Christ's cross that really sort of turned our lives around. And that's what sort of I was hoping to lead the reader into is like what a good, what a good and holy priest can do for people. And and I think to give the other priest a little bit of an out, uh, not that I really want to, but he's probably coming from a place of of mercy to some extent. He obviously feels the pain and the weight of of what you're going through with your wife, and he's just trying. But at the end of the day, that's not what we need. We don't need an easy button. We need to be challenged. We need to be told the truth. Uh, and that's what really you you hit this theme over and over and over again is that these priests who tell the truth, who, even though it might be hard, it might be difficult, they, with tact and with reverence and with care for the person, understand that that's what's best for them. Uh, and you do that over and over again. And there's, <laughs> it also, it's a quick read because it's very interesting and there's a lot of great stories in it because directly after, so this, this conversation with you and your wife and this holy priest who happens to be your uncle takes place uh, on a, what's called, I don't know what the day of the week it was, but two days later, what happens? Two days later, my uncle was murdered in that same rectory where we visited him. Uh, a homeless sort of tree trimmer stumbled out of a bar um, high on, uh, proven later, high on cocaine and drink it all night, broke into his rectory and stabbed him to death in grotesque fashion. And the rest of the book from there on out is not quite a tribute to him, but it's, it's listen, this guy had his life cut short. He had his life cut short, and it still had all of this fruit that we didn't know about, that, that, that came from the short life that he had, uh, because he was just one guy, one holy priest 
did all of this great work, even though his life was was taken from him. Uh, and I think that's that's just that's the preface to the book, <laughs> and then the rest of the book goes into it. Um, what really inspired? You know, it sounded like to you this was a long time coming. But what were what were the inspirations for wanting to do this book? Well, you know, Joe, we, it, this this book has been banging around on my head for for twenty twenty five years. Um, I had uh, I had sensed in my own diocese um, what seemed to be from the altar for many 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 years sort of a contraception of truth, you know, rather than sort of a, an introduction to the, the sacred heirlooms of everything our Catholic faith uh, gives, it was, it was sort of a damning up. And so rather than, uh, you know, my pastor or associate introducing me to the bridge that would take me to heaven, it was, it was almost like a closing up of that bridge. Um, and, and, you know, after a while, you know, well, you know, you know, Father... Father's just, um, he's a gentler or more merciful priest, or he's, he's just doesn't want to come down too hard on us or whatever. I, after a while, I said, you know, this, this, <laughs> I'm not being led to heaven. And worse yet, I'm not leading my wife and, and my kids to heaven because we're just, we're just not being fed with all of the Catholic heirlooms, the Eucharist, the Holy Hour, the Rosary, the, 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 the introduction to the saints, the, 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 the devout prayer life, you know, trying to get to a few extra weekday masses, whatever it might be, it was all being contracepted. So, so finally one day I said, man, you know what? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind addressing what I thirst for from a priest. And that's when I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my words down on paper. The, uh, the book itself, again, I, I think when you, when you look at the, the model uh, of a priest that, that you're really looking for, uh, it, you do it so often in the terms of a good father. Uh, I, I myself, I have four young children. You use the example, you know, waking up in the middle of the night at two thirty in the morning. A good father is going to to jump out of bed. I mean, obviously, he's not really excited about waking up at two thirty in the morning, but he understands that's his duty, that's his obligation. A good father has difficult conversations with his children. He does not take the easiest route uh, in order to understand that it's an investment in their future. And you make these these great parallels between spiritual fatherhood. Uh, and then you know, biological fatherhood, I guess, um, and how a great priest, you know, would be willing at two thirty in the morning to leave his phone on next to his bed and jump out of bed if, if God forbid, if, if there's an emergency going on uh, with a with a parishioner or whomever it is, somebody who needs healing. Uh, I just I love that because I, I, can, I can get that, I can resonate to that because that's that's the life that I'm living. Sure, you know, every good father knows he's in the midst of a struggle fest. Life is a struggle fest. You're going to have kids off the rails. You're going to have a, maybe a son who falls away from the faith or a daughter who's breaking her curfew every other Saturday. But, you know, I, it, it's like, you know, you hate to analogize, but you almost have to. There's a symmetry. You know, it's the, the father who might fall asleep to his daughter's curfew that gets in at 3 in the morning, it, it's, it's like the priest who shuts his cell phone off at 9 p.m., who doesn't have it on at 3 a.m. to take that call, or, or maybe the, you know, the, the, the father who allows his daughter to dress a certain way that just is promiscuous and, and doesn't really, you know, uh, bring her, bring her back into a more accommodating outfit. It's like the, it's like the priest who would allow um, women at a, at a wedding to, to wear risky clothing. It's, it's, it's the father simply understands that he is there to protect, whether it's the dad at home or the father on the altar in the parish in the rectory or the chancery, he is there to save souls and lead them to heaven. And that's a struggle fest. And it's not all about mercy. It's about, hey, honey, I love you. I love you so much, but I'm, I'm going to drop the hammer here. You're not going to wear that outfit. And if you come in again at 3 in the morning when your curfew is 11 o'clock, then you know what? You're in restriction for a month because I love you. It's all about love. It's all about love. And we know that the greatest measure of love is Christ on a cross suffocating. You know, he died. He gave all. And that's what the Father, whether in the rectory or at home, what he's compelled to do. And your your book gives many, not just all from from uh, from your uncle, Father uh, Father Tommy, uh, but from many other priests. And you talked about the story of uh, going on the trip to the college campus there, in, I believe South Carolina, and you know that priest was also you know calling sin out when he saw it, and and but also calling them to repent and calling them to mercy. Um, but but being that father figure, and you mentioned just so many examples of it throughout the book, uh, and I think again as a, as a man. That was very attractive to me. It was attractive to me to say, you know, what I'm doing isn't right. You know, I, I, I am a sinner. I need help. 
Uh, I need someone to call me out to that. And as a as a guy, I think one of the reasons you're seeing men leaving the Catholic Church and why you're not seeing the call to vocations as much is because we're not being called to something great. Uh, men love a challenge. Men love heroes. They love, uh, you know, when, when, whether it's the comic book character movies where there's, you know, the the hero uh, who, who does stuff or the, the Super Bowl winning quarterback or sports in general. We love the struggle uh, with the hero coming out on top. We love being challenged. In this this book, the model that it gives for priests it is. I mean, I feel like if I would if I would have read this when I was twenty, uh, man, like it lays this this incredible vision out for what a priest could look like. Uh, and I think you're. I mean, I'm assuming you've heard some <laughs> some feedback from priests, good and bad. Uh, I'd be curious on what you've gotten out of it from from people who have discerned into the priesthood. Well, Joe, I've I've heard from priests from six continents. Matter of fact, I heard from a, a priest from England yesterday who uh, who said, you know, Kevin, I, I'm I'm consistently told by my brethren, by my fellow priests out here on the shores of Walsingham, wherever that is, uh, to soften, to soften up, to go, to go a little less hard. And he said, "I read your book; it landed in my hands, and I realized, no, I can't. I'm a priest of God. Um, it, it's my job to save souls. So thank you for your challenge. So, so Joe, I, I have heard from. I think it's safe to say, uh, man, I, I, I guess more than a hundred priests then. And over and over and over again, um, I've I've heard, thank you for the challenge and the support uh, that sort of leads me to uh, attentiveness to my own flock. And 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 what they're saying, I think, is there's a massive sort of uh, wave of a fatherlessness out there. Um, and and let's be candid, it's it's a time for candor in American Catholicism. I think one of the greatest plagues. In our church today is that anti-fatherhood. It's it's it comes from chancery. I mean, we saw it with the scandals of 2018. That still the, the the lack of transparency. The priests and bishops that that um, rather than diving into souls and doing the hard work that it takes, it, Joe, for you and I as fathers at home, the hard work that it takes 24/7. In a certain degree, many priests and bishops have chosen what I see to be a bachelorhood. You know, they're looking interiorly rather than out. John Vianney worked 16, 18 hours every day of his life as a priest. He heard confessions 12 hours a day, and he converted the entire countryside of France that was garroted after the French Revolution because he was a father attuned to souls. And I think the priests that have read this book have said, thank you for reminding me of uh, John Vianney, of what Tom Wells did, of what these other fatherly priest did. So I, I think the challenge was, um, it's something that lives in me and Joe, I think it lives in you and I, and, and I think it lives in many priests too. So obviously a lot of our listeners are not priests today. We are lay people. Uh, many of us are, and I'm just curious, what do you think the advice is that you get, uh, whether it comes out of the book or just you personally from writing the book, uh, to us and the lady, how can we help, uh, to make the great priest that the church needs? Well, I, I think I think it's it's pretty simple, actually. Number one, if we're not praying for priests every day, then we're simply not in the game. Priests need our prayers, especially the ones that are that are working hard, that are grinding. You know, that the ones that are putting in the sweat equity. And really, if we're praying, and and, and you know what, we can fast for them too. I know I fast for. I, I'm lucky. I have uh, I have several priest friends, and I fast for them. I pray for them. I offer up rosies for them. But I think on a practical level, what's very important for us to do is to approach our pastor and say, hey, Father, you know, what's going on at the parish? Where are you lacking help? Is it, uh, par- is it with parking on Easter and Christmas? Is it cooking casseroles? Is it leading a men's group? Where are you hurting? Because I want to help you out. So there's so many ways we can help our priests because they are, they are the hardworking ones are overburdened. Um, they don't mind because they know their identity is the burden of their identity to save souls, but we can help so much just by being their friend, by praying for them, and helping them out. So your your book does talk a lot about fasting. Uh, on this show, we're very pro-fasting. Uh, let the record show, extremely pro-fasting on this show. Uh, and I, I thought it was great how many examples you brought in of these of these great priests who are just devoted to a holy hour in the morning. Uh, they, they regularly fast. Uh, you make this model uh, that's again, I think, very, very attractive. Uh, and then you end it actually towards the end of the book. There, like the last few pages are really just at oh, how many twenty, twenty different uh, suggestions of what it of what it looks like. Um, 
and all of them again right right to the point i think you do such a good job of of making it attractive to show us this is what a holy uh, a holy priest looks like and i think you do a great job also of weaving in the fact that you can tell the church has had a lot of bad priests with what's happened uh with the scandals in, in the last 20 30 years uh and how we just we need to if we're going to save the church if we're going to grow the church this is how uh, how we're going to do it. And so I, I love the way you've laid out that vision. I love the way uh, the book just continues to do it. And the other thing I think is <laughs> really cool, there there are a lot of miracles built. You've had a heck of a life, Kevin. I mean, you've had a heck of a life. Uh, can you tell us the story about the, uh, uh, the, I guess, the, the near-death experience you had and the priest that helped us to save your life? Sure, simple as this, Joe. I, I had an aneurysm in my brain 10 years ago, um, it's called arterial venous malformation. Many who have it die instantly. I was lucky enough to be rushed to a hospital in Baltimore. Uh, nothing was working. They tried to embolize it through catheters. They, they, the shunts weren't draining the blood that was drowning my, my brain. Um, so my wife, thank God, had the, had the wisdom to call in Father Jim Stack, who was my uncle's best friend. Uh, my uncle had been dead for 10 years at this point. Um, Father Jim um, Father Stack came into my bedroom and he said, hey, Kevin, man, I understand the surgery didn't take. I had just been given surgery. I was under for, I think, eight to 10 hours and it didn't work. So he came in and I was pretty much out of it. And he said that he bent down at my bedside and said, we've been calling on the Baltimore Saints, the Maryland Saints. We just finished the Divine Chaplet. Is there any saint that we can call on right now to intercede for you? And he said, and his healing assistant said that I opened my eyes and I said, bring my uncle down, bring Tommy down. So he went to the foot of my bed and he said, hey, hey, Tommy. He's talking to his best friend now. He said, hey, Tommy, man, um, your nephew, Keggy, he just calling you to save his life and you got to do it. And uh, and thereafter, he said that the, the room, my neuro ICU room, that was always dark, started to pop with light and he felt a warmth. Um, cascading sort of a change in temperature in the room. And they both will tell you if they're on the phone right now that they both almost fainted. <clears throat> and uh, one had to grab the bed. And he said, I knew I was standing in the middle of a miracle when I sensed the heavenly court surrounding your bed and your uncle was standing at my side. I knew what happened with your surgery. I knew that nothing was working, but I also knew that you were cured. And the next day they stuck me in one of those MRI tubes and uh, everything was gone. The oh. arterial venous malformation, all the blood that they couldn't get out, all the fluids, and I was and I was well. Again, that's that's one holy priest. That's your uncle, and then one of his friends who's also holy. I mean, just two regular guys who took who called took up the mantle uh, and lived heroic lives. Kevin, thank you for this book. How can our listeners get it? Uh, pretty easy, Joe. You can go to sophiainstitute.com. dot com. You could always go to Amazon or uh, really just your local Catholic bookstore. Kevin Wells, thank you for the work you're doing. Again, I, ladies and gentlemen, go get this book, read it. You're going to love it, and then give it to somebody else. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Joe, thanks for having me. Awesome. Stick around. We're going to head to a short break. We'll be right back. Why do folks give to the Catholic Tuition Organization? Probably because they love Catholic schools, right? Partially, but they also like the tax benefits, or they were helped when their kids were in school, or they have been blessed and want to bless others. Whatever the reason, the 65% tax credits are great, and after all, it's for the kids and their future. Online, ctoiowa.org. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, Dr. Christine Mulcahy, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Kevin Wells. He's out there, man. He's out there on the front lines, uh, and it just, it's just—it's awesome. That's what we need. It's the vision. It's the vision of what the church can be. The again, the book I mentioned it many times during the interview. 
but the example of what one person, one person can do. I had never heard of Monsignor Thomas, but you understand through the book, through the course of the whole book, the difference one man can make. One good holy priest can change an entire community, can change countless lives. And it gives you hope. It really does. It gives you hope. Uh, and hopefully there's another you know, generation of these great men uh, who are willing to do it, to lay their lives down for their flock. And he paints the vision of what that looks like. So again, I just encourage you to read the book and to share it with as many people as possible. And then again, what is our call? How do we respond to that? I think we've got to minister to our priests. We've got to hold them up. Uh, we've got to help them however we can. Uh, we have to encourage them to speak hard truths, tell them that we'll stand behind them. We've got their backs. Uh, we're here to help them uh, as they try to help us. I think that's really important. And again, gentlemen, Lent, a couple days away. If you haven't already figured out what you're doing, take it seriously. Do Exodus 90. Again, tomorrow, Fat Tuesday, that's the day that we heard about it for the first time ever. We had you know roughly uh, 12 hours to mentally prepare for it. Do it. Go big. Uh, really embrace the cross, embrace suffering. Um, but at the same time, make sure that you've got a plan of how am I going to look more like Jesus when Easter shows up, when Easter gets here, how am I doing that? What am I doing in my life to make that happen? Use this opportunity. Thank you again for joining us on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis, and it's time to man up. Man up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulis. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.